the New England states uh, hard to predict uh, the yeah. weather? Yeah. I, Why uh, is that? Uh, be, weather soup. Is what we soup, have. Yeah. Weather soup is what we have here. If you want to think about New Hampshire, one of the, and one of the amazing things about New Hampshire too, and the station that we have is we have coverage almost straight to the Canadian border, all the way down to you know the northern suburbs of Boston, all the way out to the seacoast bordering in the main towns, and all the way now out into Keene and even into uh, eastern Vermont. Hmm. This, as far as a television station is concerned, and as a meteorologist, because we are really for all intents and purposes, the only station on in certain times of the day here in the state covering the entire state. Uh, as meteorologists, our job is very challenging and there's no other station in the country that has to cover this broad of an area and try to get as specific as we do. I mean, you could say, well, the Weather Channel does it, but they're not specific down to your neighborhood. When you're seeing like that local forecast, that's something that's being pulled out of the National Weather Service. That's not something that they do. Uh, so they can be a little bit more general because they're, they're a nationwide channel. For us, not only do we have to forecast for a huge area, but we've got to be specific to each area because people are expecting that from a local television broadcast. One of the amazing things about New Hampshire, like you were saying, why is it so hard? In New Hampshire especially, you've got the mountains. The area north of the mountains where I used to go to school is literally in a different climate. I mean, it's literally considered a different climate than the rest of the state. It's considered a climate that you would find out in the Nebraska and in the Northern Plains and the Dakotas, whereas the rest of the climate for the state is something that you might find, uh, the climate in Southern New Hampshire, you know, a lot of my relatives will ask me, oh, it must be a terrible winter up there in New Hampshire. I'm like, I live 30 minutes away from you. It's not that much different in Salem, New Hampshire than it is in Salem, Mass, you know, or in Greater Boston and Haverhill and, in, you know, in Georgetown and that area. Um, it doesn't, you know, as you know, I mean, we're bordering towns. It doesn't make that much of a difference. But yet up in Berlin, the weather can be significantly different. So, I mean, now you're talking uh, the Monadnock region, you know, one of the snow belts out there in the Washington Sunapee area, whereas you may not get that. And uh, I, I, I love when every, every now and again, if you if your weather forecast, especially when it comes to snowfall amounts, Whatever you do, you are never going to get every part of the state right because we have such a varying state. There's going to be somebody that picks up 12, 13 inches if you say 10 or 11. We really do make a concerted effort to try to break down you know, what, what the difference between the seacoast will be. And there are huge differences. You know, even here in the Merrimack Valley, you head out uh, towards the western part of the state, towards Nashua and points west, there can be huge differences in elevation. That can make huge differences in weather forecasting. So, so you figure, what, three, four, five forecasts for New Hampshire at the same time? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so you wonder why it makes it so challenging. And then New England in general is one of these places that you've got the ocean, you've got the mountains, this, this whole weather soup thing. You never know what you're going to get. I mean, and it's amazing. You know, we, we were looking back our, you know, earlier on in the week. You know, you've got, it's, it's, again, only in New Hampshire, you've got temperatures in the 90s. The next day, you've got temperatures in the 60s. You think a hurricane is going to blow you away, and it feels like fall. And, yeah. you know, and, then, and then it turns right around towards the end of the week. It is amazing how rapidly things change around here. And being almost halfway between the North Pole and the equator will do that to you. And then, in addition, you've got all those other variables, like I had mentioned, the mountains, the ocean, and, and that sort of thing. Is there any? new equipment coming out that uh, will improve the forecast or is it pretty much going to be just about as good as it's going to be for a while? And back in the early 90s, you know, when I was in school and, and you know, I was following a lot of that stuff, the big new thing out at that time was Doppler radar because we didn't have it back then and it is amazing to think, you know, of course we're talking 10 some odd years ago, but they were just deploying it at the time. They started, of course, in the Midwest where they have tornadoes. The wonderful thing about Doppler radar, and for those that don't know, it works on the principles of the Doppler shift, and that being that sound that is moving, or things that are moving away from you are going to sound differently than things are moving towards you. I'm sure you've heard it with a car horn, you know, something right. like that. Right. Exactly, it's exactly the, uh, the, the, the way it works in that we can now see raindrops that are literally making a different echo, and the way that radar works is, let's say this is a raindrop out here and I'm a radar station, I throw a beam of energy, if it hits a radar, if it, if it hits a, uh, a raindrop, it will bounce back and to the listening station back at the dish. Well, one of the beautiful things is now not only can we see that there's raindrops there, but now we can see is it moving towards us or is it moving away from us. And why is that important? If you have something like a tornado that moves around, mm -hmm. you can see wind that's moving towards an area or away from an area, and you can maybe see a tornado forming in the clouds before it ever hits the ground. Fortunately, something we usually don't have to worry about around here, but it's pretty huge. I mean, it, it's, again, 
even five minutes of advance warning in severe weather, be it a tornado, wind damage, that sort of thing around airports, can make the difference between life and death. And that's something that has been a huge difference. Now, one of the things that uh, folks probably also don't realize is we don't have a lot of weather reports across the country. We, don't, we, we, we deal with what we call a big data gap, and a lot of it's become automated now to the point where it's not always reliable. Um, we'll, we'll have one of the computerized, because computers still can't tell you to a fault, is it raining, is it snowing, is it sleeting? And there are mornings, especially before a lot of our weather watchers call in, that can be just uh, disastrous. I mean, it'll say, and you know right well, Whitefields, uh, Salem was reporting 40 degrees, Lawrence, Mass is where our airport uh, temperature comes from in this area, 40 degrees and it'll say it's, it's raining, or 50 degrees and it's snowing. Well, you and I know that it's not going to be snowing at 50 degrees, you know, nine times, uh, 99 times out of 100. Uh, at the same time, when it's 33, 34 and it says it's raining or snowing, do you believe it? Yeah. You know, it's not always, the computer sensors are not always right on that. So, and in the state of New Hampshire, we only have, for the entire state, we only have 11 weather reporting stations. That's it. And there are some huge data gaps. I mean, uh, the Sunapee area north of the Lakes region, between the Lakes region and the White Mountains, we don't know what's going on half the time unless we have weather watchers kind of call in and report that mm. information and uh, hopefully are delivering reliable weather information. That being said, in the upper atmosphere, which we also have to look at, we can look at the weather near the ground and that's all well and good and that's important, but uh, I'm sure a lot of folks have heard of the jet stream, which kind of steers right. storms around. That doesn't happen near the ground, thank goodness, or we'd all be in trouble. It's way, you know, 34,000 feet in the air. How do we get that information? The same way we got it in the 1950s. Two times a day, they send off weather balloons from, uh, and not from too many places. As a matter of fact, the closest place to us that they send that out is down in Taunton, Massachusetts. Hmm. There's one in Albany, there's one in Burlington, Vermont, and there's one just outside of, and there's, no, there's one outside of Portland, Maine. Four readings in New England, that's it, two times a day. So not only are we not getting hourly information out of what's going on upstairs, so then, then you're saying, well, my God, I mean, how things can change. So mm -hmm. now, one of the beautiful things about Doppler radar is it was supposed to be able to, back in the early 90s, it was going to be the magic that was going to replace these, these balloons. It was going to be what they called uh, profiling of yeah. the atmosphere, where they were going to be able to use, shoot that Doppler radar up in the sky. And even if it wasn't raining, they were going to be able to see all the wind profiles. It could do it once an hour. Uh, that would have been all wonderful. The amazing thing is computer power back then wouldn't have been enough. There wouldn't have been enough storage space mm -hmm. to, because if you're thinking about a global atmosphere, you know, four stations in New Hampshire may not be that much, but once you start doing the hundreds and hundreds that are across the globe and you have to look at that, it tends to add up. So what got you into meteorology and then we'll have to close? Absolutely. Uh, I was on a, 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 remember a movie called The Wizard of Oz? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, uh, they, the tornado scared the heck out of me. So I, <laughs> so I learned how to write my last name when I was three years old, went to the library, checked out a bunch of books on tornadoes, encyclopedias and that sort of thing. and. Literally, the rest is history, and you'll find a lot of people in this business Excellent. will uh, will will Let's will have been that way. Yeah, my cat was into it since he was a young kid too. It is <laughs> we are a rare and strange breed. I hope you come back at another time. I would love to further. Absolutely, and we can even talk about severe weather. Uh, yeah, stuff, stuff maybe like that, you know, which is another by the winter we can talk about winter storms, and I'd absolutely love to. It's been great spending the uh, last half hour with you.